Hey everyone, it's Ankylosaur. I hope you're all doing well. Today, I decided to make a video on some old school, casual pauper EDH commanders, as opposed to my usual competitive videos. These are all uncommon creatures from the olden days of Magic that don't see as much play these days, but are some sweet options if you're looking for something different to build around for your next PDH deck. I have one of each color for you, and instead of trying to be super spiky and winning the game as efficiently as possible, today's decks are much more focused on fun interactions with underrated commanders and generally creating a good play experience for everybody. I'll give you a short intro to each deck, and if you're interested, you can check them out at the Moxfield links down in the video description below. So with all that out of the way, let's talk some old school commanders. Our first deck is Daru Warchief. This comes from Scourge's Warchief cycle, the most famous of which is Goblin Warchief, which saw significant 60 card play back in the early 2000s. The Warchiefs all give creatures of a certain type a cost reduction, plus a buff of some sort. And the one I decided to build around is the soldier member of the cycle. This 4 mana 1 1 may not seem very good at first glance, but its static ability, giving all of your soldiers plus 1 plus 2, actually affects itself as well. So he's a 2 3 that gives all your other soldiers a holy strength too. And we have a lot of soldiers in the deck. All but 6 of our 35 creatures have the soldier type, and we're running Captain's Call and you're confronted by robbers as well, which each make three 1-1 one -one soldier tokens. With our commander in play, not only do we get to flood the board with discounted soldiers, we get to pump them up as well, making them hit harder and protecting them from most of the sweepers in the format with the extra two toughness. Then, once we have an army on board, we have several pump spells that grow our entire team, including Guardian's Pledge, which is one of the best overrun effects in the format, and we also get to run Frontline Strategist, who has potential for huge blowouts, fogging our opponent's creatures while still allowing ours to get in for damage. If you like playing creature-based aggro decks that can really push damage on the table, this might be the one for you. Next up, we have a blue deck looking to do something very different in the format, and that's Sea Singer. Sea Singer is originally from Fallen Empires, and she has this wonky old text box to prove it. She's a 3-mana 0-1 merfolk, and she basically has three abilities. One, you have to sacrifice Seasinger if at any time you control no islands, which shouldn't be a problem in our mono blue deck. You can choose not to untap Seasinger during your untap step. And the important one, you can tap Seasinger to gain control of target creature whose controller controls an island for as long as Seasinger remains tapped. There is a ton of theft effects in Pauper EDH, and even fewer that steal a creature pseudo-permanently. The deck has a number of ways to give our opponents islands in case they're not playing blue, such as Spreading Seas and Jinx. And it has a cute combo in our Kaomancer and Ghostly Flicker. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, that's not cute at all, that's just the Peregrine Drake combo. But in this deck, we're using Ghostly Flicker as a way to keep whatever creature we steal. They don't tend to word cards like this very often anymore, but Ghostly Flicker specifies that the creatures you blink return to play under your control. It doesn't matter who owns the creature. Once we control it, we can blink it with Ghostly Flicker and keep it forever. Then during our next turn, we untap Sea Singer, steal something else, and blink the Archaeomancer and our newly stolen creature to keep that one, too. There are a couple of untap effects in this deck for the combo as well. While you can't untap Sea Singer with its ability on the stack, the ability won't do anything when it resolves in that case, you can untap Sea Singer with, say, Freed from the Reel once you've flickered and kept the creature you've stolen to steal something else right away, then do the flicker combo again and again until you're either out of mana or out of creatures to steal. If you love playing with your opponent's cards, I definitely recommend giving this one a spin. Next, we have the black deck, which I had an incredibly difficult time building. Old school black uncommon creatures tend to either work solely with zombie strategies, kill everything in play every turn, or in the case of Noxious Ghoul, both. 
I wanted something a little more fun and unique than that, so I eventually settled on Senger Autocrat. This is an aristocrat-style deck, the one that purposely avoids fleshbag marauder effects, which can be miserable to play against in a casual setting. Feel free to add some of those in if you like them, though. They'd definitely be great in this deck. Anyway, the idea of this one is simple. Play Senger Autocrat, which makes four bodies for four mana. Then, imagine you have a vampire aristocrat in play. You sacrifice the surf tokens to pump up your vampire, and finally, using a grave flicker on the autocrat itself, sacrifice the autocrat too, bringing it back into play to generate three more tokens, all of which you could sacrifice again to the vampire. With only your commander and one grave flicker, that's an extra 16 damage. There are also plenty of ways to sacrifice the tokens to draw cards, or make food tokens, or just drain the table out. My favorite cards in the deck are Rite of Consumption, basically a black fling to throw a giant creature at one of our opponents and take them out, and the sneaky Wedding Invitation, which not only makes a creature unblockable, but also gives that creature lifelink if it's a vampire. Many of our aristocrats just happen to be vampires, as well as efficient sacrifice outlets, so we can attack in for a huge amount of damage and gain that much life as well. If you like sacrificing your stuff as much as I do, I definitely recommend giving Senger Autocrat a shot. Next up is our red deck, which is also on the sacrifice plan. This time though, we get our sack outlet in the command zone. This is my ATOG deck. As you might expect with an ATOG deck, this one is all about artifacts that we can eat for value, as well as ways to make our commander a giant lethal threat. We're running a bunch of ways to give ATOG double strike and or trample, as well as a fling for the old school 60 card pauper kill. We also get a couple of pseudo ATOGs in Scrapyard Steelbreaker and Pentagon Strongbull. And we get Reckless Fireweaver and Ingenious Artillerist, to deal damage to our opponents whenever we play an artifact, which make up almost half of our entire deck. The rest of the list is filled out with efficient red removal, plus cards like Big Score and Unexpected Windfall to give us some card draw and make some treasure tokens that we can sacrifice to our commander. It doesn't take much to deal 16 commander damage with this deck, considering all the sacrifice fodder we're running. So if you're into Voltron strategies, Atog is a ton of fun. Finally, we have our green deck, headed up by one of my favorite creatures from Mirage Block, and that's Stampeding Wildebeests. This deck is based in part on an old Type 2 deck called Stupid Green Deck, which Seth Byrne made waves with at US Nationals way back in 1998. It used Stampeding Wildebeests with a suite of spike creatures and creatures with Enters the Battlefield abilities to bounce during your upkeep, plus a heavy land destruction suite to grind the game out and gain a powerful resource advantage over your opponent. Land Destruction isn't particularly relevant in PDH, but in the 25 years since Stupid Green was built, creatures have only gotten better and better, with excellent abilities we can rebuy every turn. The deck runs a whopping 40 creatures, almost all of which do something when they enter the battlefield. Everything from drawing cards, to making treasure tokens, to gaining us the initiative to destroying artifacts or enchantments. There's even a sticker package, which leans more into stickers that cost 3 plus tickets than I would normally run in competitive Pauper EDH, not only because we get to reuse our ticket producers each turn, but because this is casual PDH and the big ability stickers can be a ton of fun. If you're not a fan of stickers, no worries. There's only four cards in the deck that actually care about them, and it's the easiest thing in the world to replace them with cards you'll actually enjoy. So, if you're into Blink decks, but want to run something other than the traditional Azorius colors for a change, I highly recommend this one. Getting to reuse your creatures every turn is a ton of fun, and the Wildebeests themselves are a very quick trampling clock that can help you close out games in no time. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Again, if you'd like to see deck lists for any of the decks I talked about, you can find all the links down in the video description below. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you have any other old school Pauper EDH commanders that you enjoy, 
please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear what else you've been playing in the format. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Bye.